I'm not sure. I'm sorry. Good afternoon. Welcome to the Alcohol Beverage Board of St. Mary's County, February 10th, 2022 meeting. As we prepare to open the meeting, here are some guidelines. Public meetings are now open to the public. This public hearing is being televised live on St. Mary's County Governmental TV 95 and the county's YouTube channel. It will remain available on, um, for online viewing on the St. Mary's County Government YouTube channel. My name is David Willemborg. To my right is the Vice Chairman, Richard Watts. Um, at the end is Leonard Cole. To my left, Member Barbara Hill. And to my far left, we have Member Shin. Tammy Hildebrand, our administrators here. Chris Beaver, our attorney. Susie Dean, our recording secretary. Kevin Hall, our inspector. First item on the agenda on our agenda is to approve the agenda. We have a motion to approve the agenda. Yeah, I'll make a motion to approve the agenda. Okay, Member Cole makes the motion to approve. Do we have a second? I'll second that. Member Hill? Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 It's unanimous, thank you. Okay, the next item is going to be the approval of the meeting minutes from 13 January 2020. Do we have a, um, yes, sir? Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I have a, uh, uh, an amendment to the, uh, to the minutes. Okay. Okay, under the election of vice chair, uh, you had nominated uh, member Watts for the vice chairman position. Uh, the motion was seconded by member Hill and the motion carried. I then asked uh, member Watts if he accepted that nomination. Uh, his answer was in the affirmative and then the board unanim unanimously voted for member Watts as vice chairman. Okay. Can you make those um, yeah. changes? Okay, so with those changes, we have a motion to approve the minutes. I'll make a motion we approve the minutes with the changes. Do we have a second? I'll second that. Okay, we have uh, Member Hill making the motion and the second by Mr. Cole. Any other discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. It's unanimous, thank you. Okay, new business, violations. Bob Sunoco, licensee Robert E. Um, Belden. Sale of alcoholic beverages to a person under the age of 21 in violation of uh, Article 6-304 of the Alcohol Beverage Article of the Anacoded Code of Maryland and 5.04J of the Rules and Regulations of the Alcohol Beverage Board of St. Mary's County. Please come forward. You hereby declare and affirm under the penalties of perjury that the testimony you're about to give will be nothing but the truth, the truth and nothing but the truth. I do. Okay, please state your name and address for the record. Robert Belden, the address is 45640 Hillview Farm Lane. That's in Valley Lake. Okay. Please sit down. Uh, Richard, you wanna, okay. I don't know if she needs to be sworn or so, not. So, oh. do, do we have Do something? you wanna do them together? No, are you, this is Catherine. It's yeah. Kate. They'll, you can have a seat. Huh? She's the employee. Yes. Okay, yes. Okay, did, did the violation occur, sir? I believe it did. I wasn't there, but I okay. wouldn't be here if I didn't. Do we, um, so so you plead guilty? Sure, yes sir. Okay, do you have any uh, details of what happened? Any reasons why it happened? Any circumstances that? She's human, she made a mistake. 
Okay. Mr. Belden, when did the uh, when did the violation occur? Was it Friday, Saturday during the week, or do you know? Friday. It was uh, Friday. During busy time. Uh huh. Right. A busy a busy time at the at, at the, the store. store. Okay. Um, would you go ahead and read read in the facts? Yes, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Um, the facts of this violation are as follows. On November 19th, 2021, at approximately 4.30 in the afternoon, St. Mary's County Sheriff's Office Alcohol Enforcement Unit sent a Sheriff's Office cadet, um, 20 years of age, into Bob Sunoco, located at 20321 Piney Point Road in Callaway, Maryland, uh, 20620, uh, with nothing in his possession other than $40 in cash. Once inside, the cadet retrieved uh, two mini bottles of Fireball Cinnamon Whiskey, 50 milliliters each, and proceeded to the checkout counter and placed the bottles on the counter for purchase. The clerk, later identified as Miss Catherine Mary Streisel, proceeded uh, with the sale without asking the cadet for any identification for proof of age. The cadet completed the purchase of the alcoholic beverages and exited the licensed premise. Uh, with the alcoholic beverages. The cadet thereafter reported to Corporal Patrick Handy, a member of the Alcohol Enforcement Unit outside the licensed premises. The cadet described the sale of the alcoholic beverages to Corporal Handy. Thereafter, Corporal Handy and Sergeant Myers of the uh, St. Mary's County Alcoholic um, Beverage Unit entered the licensed premise, identified themselves, and informed uh, Ms. Streisel that she had sold alcoholic beverages to an underage sheriff's cadet without asking for any identification. Ms. Streisel acknowledged she was aware that she had sold this alcohol to a minor and expressed regret for making the sale. She explained that to the officers that she was new to the job um, as an explanation for not asking for identification. Uh, photographs of the alcoholic beverages were taken by the members of the unit. Then the beverages were poured out and the bottles disposed of. All of the foregoing occurred in St. Mary's County, Maryland. Okay. Do you have any anything else, Mr. Beaver? Uh, no, Chairman. Okay. Had a few questions, Mr. Chairman. Um, sure. I guess we can open it up for questions. Go ahead, uh, Mr. Belden. Uh, how long uh, has Ms. Streisel been employed with you? At that time, it had been about thirty days. About thirty days. Um, have you provided her with, with training? I mean, what have you done as the licensee to try to mitigate any, uh, you know, any mistakes? Well, unfortunately, um, her employment was terminated because we have a zero tolerance policy. Um, she had, she, you know, made it another six weeks, she would have went to our next training um, because we basically once a year, we go, we refresh everyone and anybody new. So that keeps everybody up to date. She just simply made a mistake and forgot. Sure. But so in that 30 days that she had been employed with you, had you provided her with some level of training to, to be able to man yeah. the counter? First thing we tell people, you have two, two jobs, check IDs and stock the shelves. That's it. Okay. Mm -hmm. And was she, uh, was she alone at the time of the sale or were there other employees that time, she helping actually her? She was transitioning between two employees. Okay. So I think the person had left around four. We had an additional person coming in at five, you know, both of them more experienced. It's just, again, uh, I went an hour window where you showed up and she made the mistake of not checking. Mm -hmm. Sure. Okay. But you feel like you've done, as, again, as the licensee, you've done everything you can to try to adequately train your staff uh, to, to ensure that these mistakes do not happen. Well, we make it crystal clear in terms of what they are to do that unless they're absolutely 100% per, you know, certain that that person is 21, they have to check IDs. Again, she just forgot. She was new. Okay. Mm -hmm. Fair enough. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Belden, how long how long has has the uh, uh, you're no longer selling gas at the uh, Sunoco station? Is that correct? That's correct. Uh, so it's strictly now a <clears throat> beer, wine, and liquor store. Correct. We also have sporting goods in the back. Sporting goods in the back. Yeah. Okay. So you all transitioned to that. How long have you been in business? Uh, since 2009. As, as strictly liquor, correct? No. Or, or alcohol, I mean. We had beer initially. We transitioned right. to alcohol back in, I think it was 2013 and 14. 
that time right around. right but you started carrying that in 2009 correct correct okay uh tammy has there been any violations in the last three years no no okay um okay any questions that was that was going to be my question what were the uh, past record in terms of any, any past violations mm -hmm. so it sounds like there there hasn't been so this is the first time in the last three in the years. Last three years, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. We're going to move to the penalty phase. Okay. That's a discussion between us. Um, I recommend the standard, which it's a thousand dollar fine, which is um, basically it's reduced to five hundred. Until the unless in the next three years you have another offense and then that 500 other 500 be applied and then there'd be additional fine on top of that. <clears throat> um, otherwise, after three years, then um, you know you're you're clear. Uh, and also RAS training. Are we ready to do that again? Right. We're back. We're back. Okay. So those are my recommendations. Are we doing any kind, Mr. Chairman, are we doing any kind of uh, suspension on the license itself? Uh, not for a first violation, typically. Okay. First violation, that's not part of the matrix. Okay. Unless the fine isn't paid within 10 days. Mm -hmm. Yes, please remind them that they have to pay the fine within 10 days. Right. If I could, Mr. Chairman, it's within the purview of the board to, to revoke or suspend the license under the statute. Um, that's one of the possible penalties that could be that could be offered by this board. And it, you know, you could do either suspension, revocation, fine, or both. Mm -hmm. So, so I'm being being a new kid on the block here. What has been? You mentioned this was a standard. What has been the the past? Is is, is that has been the it's for a first time offense? The that's the, that's the recommended. That's the recommended for the first time offense. There's been, it's been a while since we had any penalties given out. In the early day, earlier days of COVID, they were, they were a little less lenient as businesses were, you know, great concern that they were failing. But uh, I think we're in a more mature, you know, COVID world now and. Um, and for the benefit of, of board members and the maximum fine by statute is a thousand dollars right so my my intent here this being the first time and objective being that you don't want to have the repeat of this right so is what's the best way for both executing that objective if you will so uh, that's what i was after and against weighing that against the past being consistent with past penalties if you will so i my intention is not to just try to crack down, if you will, but trying to, to, to do a reasonable um, accommodation, if you will, to make sure that it doesn't happen again next time. So what, what is the right solution for that is what, I'm, what I was after, basically. Mr. Shen, you can go ahead and amend <coughs> that motion if you... I don't think it was a motion. There's no motion. There's no motion, motion, the motion yet. There's no motion. Discussion of, okay. of the fine. Right. You can make a... Okay, so, so maybe, comment to that if you okay, want. So, so perhaps may, may I ask a question? I don't want to be inconsistent with how it's been done dealt in the past. So like, you know, I've gotten, I have pretty good driving record and mm -hmm. I know that I get caught for speeding and people make mistakes, right? We all, mm -hmm. we all make mistakes, business make mistakes. And I'm, um, maybe a year, two, year, two years ago, I was, I was stopped for speeding, but when the, the police officer saw that I had a clean record, you know, he let me off with a warning, uh, and that prevented me to to watch myself and not not violate that again. So that served its purpose for what I was trying to, what the police, I believe the police officer was trying to do, and also it ser served me as well. So again, I, for that purpose, trying to prevent any future violations, what is adequate uh, action here is what I'm what I'm after. But again, I I don't know how it's been done in the past, if the consistency has been uh, a penalty and if it's down to uh, how much are we talking about, uh, then that's, that's one discussion. 
but I, I was specifically asking, has there been a, any type of warning, if you will, for first offense in the three years so that he, mm -hmm. per, the business can potentially uh, have a chance to right itself? Generally, no. Okay. Um, right. what, Tammy, since you've been here the longest, would you explain how this, this um, penalty matrix was developed and where it came from? The penalty matrix was put together by the Retail Beverage, in coordination with the Retail Beverage Association, the Community Alcohol Coalition, the Alcohol Enforcement Coordinator, and they put together the matrix, brought it before this board, and asked them to adopt it into their rules and regulations. Okay. Um, the board, the only um, change that the board made was that it become a, a may versus a shall. Mm -hmm. so that the board could look at each case individually versus making it in stone that this is what you have, this is exactly what you're gonna get if you're a first timer or a second timer. So it gives the board um, the ability to look at the cases case by case according to the facts and base their decision on the facts. It is a guide. Okay. So the penalty has, has before changed a little bit. We had a case where somebody actually had almost no staff, um, water spilled on the floor, near the register, total chaos, I made a mistake, mm -hmm. you know? And that was dealt with differently from a 30-year employee who was about ready to pull their hair out of their head. And, you know, so when we have these, we, we try to find out if there's any sort of circumstances maybe that might want to change the, you know, and then if somebody's very negligent, mm -hmm. then you know you might want to give them the full the, the full thousand. But generally, it's five hundred and suspend. I mean, a thousand suspend five. Mr. Chairman, if I could make a recommendation, so uh, I concur with the thousand uh, dollar fine. Um, with with respect to the amount we hold in abeyance, um, uh, I'd like to make a recommendation that we were. Uh, hold an abeyance 750 instead of mm -hmm. 500. My reason for that is, is the licensee, um, it sounds like, I mean, he did take steps as the licensee to ensure that his employee was, was adequately trained. Um, uh, and then he's taken steps since then to ensure that that's not going to happen again as he's terminated the employee. Um, so from, from a licensee perspective, uh, I kind of do feel like uh, he's, he's done what he can um, to, to try to, to mitigate these sorts of things happening. I mean, however, at the end of the day, as a licensee, he's still ultimately responsible. So yes, there is a, there is a penalty that needs to be levied, mm -hmm. um, but uh, I would like to recommend that we hold 750 in abeyance instead of 500. Um, well, you guys gotta make a motion. I can make that motion. I'm, I, uh, as far as discussion here, I'm in, I'm in agreement with uh, Member Watts's uh, um, recommendation there. I've got two questions. What was the date of this offense? Was it November? November 19th, 2021. November 19th? Yes, sir. Okay. And the other thing I'd like to point out, too, is that uh, in regards to Member Watts's recommendation there, that uh, Mr. Uh, Miss uh, uh, Stretzel, I guess, uh, had only been employed for a month. Correct. See, so we have a a, a young, very, very inexperienced um, um, uh, cashier uh, to that point who had been trained, and this was as you said, a mistake. And uh, uh, so I'm, I'm in agreement with Member Watts. Um, do we need to make a motion on You would this? have to make a motion. I can make the motion. <coughs> yeah. Well, you, so you're saying 750? Yeah. 500. He's saying that. Oh, okay. So he's going, I want you to make the motion. Make the motion. I'll make the motion. All right, so uh, I'd like to make the motion um, that uh, uh, against the licensee, uh, Robert E. Belden, um, be fined $1,000 with $750 held in abeyance, pending no further violations within the next three years, uh, payment to be made within 10 days, 
uh, additional uh, licensor, uh, licensee to complete the, the responsible alcohol service training or RAST um, within the next 90 days. Uh, and this is uh, for this, due to the sale of alcohol beverage to a person under the age of 21 in violation of 5 TAC 304 of the Alcohol Beverage Article Annotation Code of Maryland, 5.04J of the Rules and Regulations of the Alcohol Beverage Board of St. Mary's County. Actually, it's 6304, is it not? 6304, correct. Uh, my apologies, my eyes. <laughs> okay, we have a motion. Can you? Second. Well, can I counter that? Um, we can have discussion. Or is that? You can amend the motion. Amend the motion? Okay. But hold what on a second. We, first, is, we're going to do this first. Is there a second to the motion? That's right. So we have a motion. Okay. Do we have a second? I'll second uh, Member Watts' motion. Okay, now we have a first, we have a second. Now we have discussion. So now you would like to make an amendment to the motion. I would like, right, I would like to make a, make an amendment to make it a 500. As a first time offender, it was a mistake. I'd like to exercise some mercy and grace here. So that's yeah, my take. I think, I think my motion did, did that. So what it is, it's a, it's a $1,000 fine. 750 is held in abeyance. Right. Okay. So basically, he'll pay within the next 10 days $250 is all he's going to pay, provided there's no other penalties within the next three years. If there's another violation within the next three years, then he has to pay the full $1,000 uh, plus okay. any new penalties they give. give okay, gotcha. So okay, clear understanding. Right. I right. did kind of okay. back off a little bit on gotcha. what, uh, what the licensee is required to pay because I do feel as a licensee he took – the, yes. okay. He took the measures necessary uh, to, to try to prevent this. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I, 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 I understand down. that better. Okay. Either, okay. So. okay, my apologies. <laughs> yeah, anything held in abeyance is, is withheld okay. um, from the, the immediate penalty. Gotcha. Okay, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm good with that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so all in favor? Aye. 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 And I oppose. The ayes have it. Did you oppose, sir? I did oppose. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. All set? You're, you're set. Ma'am? Dismissed. Okay. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Okay, next. Employee Kathleen Mary Stitzel. The above individual, Kathleen Mary Stitzel, was an employee of a license holder and sold or provided alcoholic beverage to an individual under the age of 21 years of age in violation of 28-2802B <laughs> of the Alcohol Beverage Article of the Anticoded Code of Maryland. Please come forward. Sworn in. Do you hereby declare and affirm under the penalties of perjury that the testimony, testimony you are about to give will be the truth and nothing but the truth? Yes. Okay, please state your name and home address for the record. Catherine Mary Stritzel, 46701 Almar Street, Lexington Park, Maryland, 20653. Thank you. Please come up forward and sit down. Mr. Beaver. Are we going to ask her if she acknowledges whether she did what is it? I did? guess, yes. Oh, or did, did, did the uh, event happen? Are you guilty? Yes, it did. Yes, plead guilty. Mr. Beaver. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so the, uh, the facts that are the basis of this violation are as follows. On November 19, 2021, at approximately 4.30 p.m., uh, the St. Mary's County Sheriff's Office Alcohol Enforcement Unit sent a Sheriff's Office cadet, 20 years of age, into Bob Sunoco, located at 20321 Piney Point Road in Callaway, Maryland, with nothing in his possession other than $40 in cash. Uh, once inside, uh, the cadet retrieved two mini bottles of Fireball Cinnamon Whiskey, 50 milliliters each, and proceeded to the checkout counter and placed the bottles on the counter for purchase. The clerk later identified as Miss Catherine Mary Stretzel, proceeded to, uh, with the sale without any, uh, without asking the cadet for any identification for proof of age. 
the cadet completed the purchase of the alcoholic beverages and exited the licensed premise with the alcoholic beverages. The cadet thereafter reported to Corporal Patrick Handy, a member of the alcohol enforcement unit outside the licensed premise. The cadet described the sale of the alcoholic beverages to Corporal Handy. Thereafter, Corporal Handy and Sergeant Myers of the unit entered the licensed premises, there, uh, identified themselves and informed Ms. Stretzel that she had sold alcoholic beverages to an underage sheriff's office cadet without asking for any identification. Um, Ms. Stretzel uh, acknowledged that she was aware that she had um, sold the alcoholic beverage to the minor and expressed regret for making the sale. Uh, she explained to the officers that she was new on the job um, as an explanation for why she had not asked for identification. Photographs of the beverages were taken by the members of the unit. Um, then the beverages were poured out and the bottles disposed of. Uh, all of the foregoing occurred in St. Mary's County, Maryland. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You're welcome. Do you have um, any details you want to share with us? It was just a lapse of judgment. That's all I can say it happened and I just had a lapse of judgment, that's all. Do you feel that your employer gave you adequate training? Yes. Okay. Ms. 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 Stretzel, you, <clears throat> you have been terminated from uh, this position, correct? Okay, are you currently employed? Yes. Where at? I am an assistant manager at- I'm I sorry? I'm an assistant manager at iStorage. Okay. Any other questions? Ms. Strissel, is was this your first um, first job uh, in which you sold uh, as a, a clerk alcohol? Yes. It was? Okay. Yes. So you've had no other experience no. doing this before? No. Okay. Do you, in, is this something that you would like to try to continue doing? No. <laughs> <laughs> that's a fair, that's a fair answer. It's no. a fair <laughs> answer. <laughs> yeah, I have no further questions. Anybody else? I don't have a question. Okay, I guess we don't have to have any motion or a vote on anything about it, the event happened. So we'll move on into the penalty phase. And, um, Again, the matrix is applied the same way, except RAS training cannot be, um, correct. Just, the matrix does not apply to the employee. Um, the employee falls under a different code. Your max fine for an employee is $500. Okay. Okay, just to clarify, sorry. But they, and we can't, we can't, we can't have them go to RAST. Correct. The only, the sound only like there's not going to be any need for that anyway. The only penalty that, according to statute, that can be imposed is a fine up to five hundred dollars. Right. That's what I was saying. We can't yeah. send them. We've had before. I remember people have suggested the RAS training, and we're not allowed to do that. Mm -hmm. Correct. So, I can make a motion, Mr. Chairman. Please do. I know you're not going to like it, though. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm going to make it anyway. Um, I'd like to make a motion uh, against uh, the employee, Catherine Mary Stritzel, uh, uh, for a fine of $500, $450 held in abeyance, uh, pending no further violations within the next three years, uh, payment to be made within the next 10 days uh, due to the sale of alcohol beverage to a person under the age of 21. in uh, violation of 28 TAC 2802B of the alcohol beverage articles as annotated in the Code of Maryland. I'm not sure why that one is different than the licensee, but. It's just two different sections of the code. It's gotcha. So we have a motion from member Watts. Do we have a second? I'll second member Watts's motion. Okay, we have a second. Do we have any discussion? I'll follow on discussion. Um, just ex my explanation. Um, again, um, she made a mistake. Her first, her first time doing this, doesn't sound like she's probably ever going to seek this sort of employment again. Um, 
however she does we we can we've imposed the maximum potential penalty so if another violation does occur she would then be held accountable for the maximum of the five hundred dollars but um hopefully for this one time uh offense she's effectively penalized for fifty dollars um and uh again i not this just doesn't seem to be the kind of case where we need to just hammer somebody over it was an honest mistake. Anybody else? Maybe, maybe a question. I think I heard you correctly. You said the only option that exists is either fine or, well, that was for business suspension of license. Is that is that correct? There's no other option such as community service or anything else no, as such? Or no, fine. sir. The, the statute only provides for a fine not exceeding $500, up to and not exceeding $500. Okay. Mm -hmm. But I do want to add to again, just I know you're not going to you know go into this, or you've said you're not going to go into this business again. But um, I, you know, we definitely need to understand the severity of, of of this sort of thing, right? I mean, you know, if if you know, in in this case, it was you know an undercover cadet, right? But had it been an actual uh, you know patron, right? And then, and then you just kind of have to sometimes. I mean, think about the long, the longer term consequences, right, of of what that means, and uh, you know, the after effects of of them having purchased alcohol illegally, um, and then what else could potentially ha happen from that, right? Whether they get into a car accident, whether they um, just do something else stupid, right? There's there's a reason why 21 is the is the, the age, um, so. So again, I you know, I, I I try to be a fair person, um, but at the same time, I don't want to underpin the severity um, of you know of the of the the, the consequences of, of the violation. I appreciate that, sir. Okay. okay, can we go back to discussion? So, my view of it is that we send law enforcement out to enforce the law to do checks. Law enforcement needs to be able to sit there and when they go out there and they do this, that they're gonna think that, gee, my job is being appreciated and that the board is, is supporting me in this effort. Mm -hmm. I don't think that low fines necessarily sit there and demonstrate that. Secondly, we have partners that have come back and they've given us a matrix to work with and those are their recommendations. They made those recommendations because they thought it was best to protect their industry. You know, everybody that's gonna have made a mistake. And as you sit there and go through this, year after year after year, as you sit here, you're, 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 you're also setting a precedence for the court. So somebody in the future can say, well, they gave, this person this much, and then they gave me this much. And so those are all things you guys need to sit there and understand what you're doing here today. You're setting a precedence for the future. Mm -hmm. So yeah. anyway. Um, I, I agree. I do want to add, though, that, that again, I think it's, I, I don't feel like that things can necessarily be applied in a, in a peanut butter spread fashion. Oh, right? agree. And, and, and I and believe... I believe that the owner is the one that's ultimately responsible. Agreed. And I believe that that's where, the, you know, the owner is putting them on a schedule and they've trained them and they make a mistake that the far more of the responsibility falls upon the, empl the, the employee. Agreed. I mean, the employer. And um, I don't think you ever had RAS training before, so there's, there's, there's the issue of people not having the training that they normally would have had. And so in this part of it, I, I kind of agree, but I don't agree with, with, with part one, with the business owner. Right. Mm -hmm. And you also don't know what's happened in the past. You know, so they've gone three years, but maybe they didn't go, through, maybe they only went three years and eight months and there was a, an infraction. Or they <clears throat> changed the name of the owner of the business, the, the person actually holds the license, but really the, you know, the LLC still owns it. So, you know, you could change it and that's a first infraction, but well, you know, 18 months ago, they changed uh, 
the person who was license holder. So there's a lot of things involved in here than just saying that, hey, you know, this is a first time infraction. Right. Oh, it, and I, I guess I wanted to just add, I mean, to, to me though, there is a there is a vast difference between, you know, doing doing everything you can to ensure that the violations don't happen and then they happen anyway versus gross negligence, right? Um, and, and to me, that is the key difference, whether it's a first violation or a second or a third. You know, if, if there's certainly gross negligence uh, involved that somebody just didn't do their job or didn't take these steps necessary, then absolutely, I agree with you 100%. Well, unfortunately, it's, in this case, she, she admits to being negligent and she didn't do her job. And, you know, she's already said that. So this is more of a discussion about, I guess, the first penalty that I didn't get an opportunity to. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, Mr. Chairman, I, because this, this, this um, establishment is located within my district, mm -hmm. and, and I've known Mr. Belden for years. I've, I've followed this business and everything else, and, and I know him as far as being very straightforward, uh, responsible. Um, this is a, a small, what used to be a gas station, and, and now, because of economics and everything else, the, the gas is gone, and it's, it's, yeah, it's on Route 249. That's where it is. But it's, it's more out of the way Locals use this for, you know, convenience. Um, there's another, there's another establishment that's right down the road, Abel's Tavern. But as I said, Mr. Belden has been local, local to the area for years and has been responsible, in my opinion, okay, um, to um, handling you know, the sale of alcohol. Um, and uh, that's just what I have to impart in regards to this establishment. Okay, um, very good. Okay. Anything else? We have a motion, we have a second for um, a fine of $50. Well, $500 for 50 held in a base. Right. I'll, I'll second that. Already it's already been. It's already been. Sold. Already, I second it already. Yeah, we need to now exit discussion. If everybody's ready, we're going to okay. vote. Yes, sir. All in favor? Aye. 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 I oppose. Thank you. Good luck. Thank you. Okay. Next, Patuxent Fine Wine and Spirits. Licensee, William C. Price, sale of alcoholic beverages to a person under the age of 21 in violation of 6-304 of the alcohol beverage article of the Anacoda Code of Maryland and 5 I mean 5.04B, no, J, of the rules and regulations of the Alcohol Beverage Board of St. Mary's County. Please come forward. Do you hereby declare and affirm under the penalties of perjury that the testimony you are about to give will be the truth and nothing but the truth? I do. Please state your name and address for the record. William Price, 20570 Chingville Road, Leonard Town, Maryland. Please sit down, sir. <clears throat> okay, um, would you please read the, um, the facts? He, he, I find oh, out well, whether he admits or... Okay, do you... Did the, did the yes, event? it happened. Okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank and you, now. Mr. Chairman. Uh, members of the board, uh, the, the facts that um, support this violation are as follows. On January 14th, 2022, at approximately uh, 8.50 in the evening, uh, St. Mary's County Sheriff's Office Alcohol Enforcement Unit sent a sheriff's office cadet, 20 years of age, into Patuxent Fine Wine and Spirits, located at 22599 MacArthur Boulevard in California, Maryland, uh, with nothing in his possession other than $40 in cash. Uh, once inside, the cadet ret uh, retrieved two bottles of Yukon Jack Apple Whiskey, 50 milliliters each, 
mini bottles and proceeded to the checkout counter and placed them on the counter for purchase. Mm -hmm. um, the clerk, later identified as Miss Tatiana Nicole Robinson, proceeded with the sale without asking the cadet for any identification for proof of age. The cadet completed the purchase of the alcoholic beverages and exited the licensed premise uh, with the alcoholic beverages. The cadet thereafter reported to Corporal Patrick Handy, a member of the Alcohol Enforcement Unit outside the licensed premise. The cadet described the sale of the alcoholic beverages to Corporal Handy. Uh, thereafter, Corporal Handy and Sergeant uh, Robert Merritt of the Alcohol Enforcement Unit entered the licensed premises, identified themselves, and informed, informed Ms. Robinson that she had sold alcoholic beverages to an underage sheriff off, sheriff's office cadet without asking for any identification. Ms. Robinson acknowledged she failed to ask the cadet for identification um, when making the sale and explained that uh, he looked old enough. Uh, photographs of the alcoholic beverages were taken by members of the alcoholic uh, enforcement unit. Then beverages were poured out and the bottles disposed of. All of the foregoing occurred in St. Mary's County, Maryland. Thank you. Mr. Beaver, what day of the week is January 14th? I will check my calendar. Friday. It's a Friday. It was a Friday? There you go. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, do you have anything else to add? I mean, she just don't know why she followed, didn't follow procedures. Number one, you're supposed to card everybody. Number two, our registers are set up when you scan the first item, it asks for the ID. You got to put in the month, the birth date, and the year to proceed. So I don't know how or why. She just said he looked over age and just didn't follow procedures. It just baffles me. Mr. Price, did, did Mr. She, Price, will your will your registers deny the sale? It stops. It says as how soon in the as you get that first item. How it locks you? everything up, and you got to verify the date and the year of birth. How and did she? How did she manage? To she evidently just punched in a number that she wanted to punch in instead of asking for the ID. Do we know what date was punched in? Do you maintain any kind of electronic record to I that? Have, I'm quite sure I could go back through the states, but I went even down there this morning and and run through the process again. It's the first item, lock the system up. And then I give the boy a date, he put the date in, and then it followed through with the sale, but come find out he had punched, double punched the last number. You gotta definitely have them last four date of birth year in that to proceed with the sale. Okay. Okay, so without, without verifying an ID, she just made up a number that's, that's and and conducted the sale. Conducted correct? the sale. Yes, that's mm -hmm. what I mm -hmm. gather. She said he looked old enough is the ex explanation she gave. But she, why she didn't follow procedure and ask for the ID and punch? You know, she wouldn't have had any numbers to punch in, so she would have stopped the sale. Mm -hmm. Is she still in your employ? No, she's been okay. terminated. Okay, how long, how long had she been an employee? Since the end of August. Since the end of August? Has she been through RAST training? No. Okay, do you, do you provide some kind of training for uh, the well, use we, of the, uh, the electronics? We, oh yeah, they go uh -huh. through the training and know how to work the system okay. and everything. I mean, they've got to know how to work that system to make sales. Okay. Do, do we know what, I know you said you didn't have the records on hand, but do we know what date she entered? Sir? Do we know what date that she entered in order to be able to proceed with the sale? The date of what? You, you mentioned that a date was required, uh, presumably the birth date from the driver's license. Know. Do we know what date that she actually? She put in, I didn't think about going and checking, but it's, mm -hmm. that's. Is there any? You know, Mr. Beavers, is there any way to, to command it? But to I'm sorry, I can't hear. You. Is there any way to confirm that this is the, the that that's the? No, never mind. I, I take that back. Okay. 
Do you have, uh, Mr. Price, do you have those electronic records of what she entered as far as a date? I would have to go back and look, see if I could find that tape. Should, uh, hopefully there's a register tape. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Is there any other way of overriding that transaction without putting in the proper date? No, no you've well, got to right. put those last Wait. four digits there. Okay. Yeah. Anybody else have any questions? Yeah, is, is Miss Robinson here at this hearing? I don't, I don't. Do you know? She's not here now. I mean, I had talked to her this morning, said she was coming, and then I had a text a little while ago and I give her the building number, but she's not here. A summons, mm -hmm. a summons was issued for Miss Robinson. Yes. It was I mean, served. From our conversation this morning, she was coming, but. Like Mr. Beavers, what 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 did you say? Um, let's focus on. Yeah, let's let, yeah. When we we'll, we'll, when we Mr. do the Price we'll do the right clerk now. after we finish with Mr. Price okay. about that. Okay. All right. Okay. What uh, the same question as previous session? Uh, what sort of past record do you have in terms of violations concerned past three years, especially? Well, we've only been open since May of twenty one, so we don't have any violations. This is your first violation? Yeah, but He's only been open since May of 2020. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. Has May of 2020. Yeah. Yeah. Richard, any other questions? No. Okay, I got one question. Going back from previous hearing, this person was actually one of your employees and not one from the grocery store. It was a shared employee. Shared employee. Yeah. Okay. So, anybody have any other questions? Okay, we'll move into the penalty phase. Mr. Watts. <laughs> <laughs> he's so good at it. <laughs> yeah, he's good, he's good. Right. <laughs> well, I, I mean, this one I, I struggle with a little bit more. Um, it, just because of the previous thing, but I don't know that that I should allow that to bias my. I don't. I would say we're looking at this this violation, not correct. anything else. I, yeah. So that that's why. I'm, so I apologize um, for. So, but, in order to be consistent, um, so I'll make a motion. For, against, William C. Price. Uh, for violation uh, for a penalty of one thousand dollars, <coughs> with seven hundred and fifty dollars held in abeyance, <coughs> pending no further violations in the next three years, payment to be made within the next ten days. Uh, additionally, the licensee to to complete uh, RAST training, the responsible alcohol service training, within the next ninety days. I just, uh, Tammy, I understand they've actually completed that training since the vi date of the violation. Price came in last, last week. week for our RAST class, so he has. And it was a little chilly. Okay. <laughs> well, <laughs> sorry. So then. But you're. So then, but so, you're that, yeah. Yeah. so so that so completing the RAST training will be a part of the of the vi of the penalty, but we'll consider that part completed. Yes. As part of the penalty. Um. So this is uh, due to the sale of alcohol beverages to a person under the age of 21 in violation of 6-034 of the alcohol articles of the annotated code of Maryland 5.04J of the rules and regulations of the beverage alcohol beverage board of St. Mary's County. And that's actually 6-304. <laughs> is that what I said? 6-304. You said 034. <laughs> Oh man, all right, that's twice I've messed that number up. It's, it's that number right. doesn't like me. That's why I'm here. Thank you. You're right. Keep me straight. <laughs> okay, so we have a motion. Do we have a second? No second motion. Um, I'll, I'll second that. Okay, we have a second. 
discussion? Um, so I'll, I'll add on the discussion again. Um, you know, the, uh, trying to apply some level of consistency. Um, I, I like the sound of your system. I mean, it sounds like it's 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 a good system, right? That's designed to try to prevent this kind of thing from happening. So I, I feel like again, as the licensee, he's put processes and procedures in place, as well as training of the employees. Um, additionally, taking further action by terminating the employee to ensure that that does not happen again. Um, so as a new business, uh, as a as a first time penalty, uh, again, a, it, it's a it's a penalty. I mean, it's a violation, right? I mean, and there's there's got to be penalties for that violation. I agree wholeheartedly with Chairman Wallenberg about that, which is why it is a thousand dollar penalty. Um, but again, I'm. I'm Given the other things that you've done, the efforts that you have taken to try to prevent this, I'm willing to have leniency for first violation, um, and, and which is why we'll, I'm recommending holding 750 in abeyance, vice the 500. Um, so again, I just wanted to explain my my rationale behind behind that to the board. I would, uh, in in addition to that, I would. Uh strongly advise Mr. Price to, <coughs> if there's some way electronically to figure out what date has been punched in for the verification of the sale, if you have some kind of electronic record to that, then I think that would uh, bode very well in, uh, in any kind of violation such as this. Yeah. Because I, I, I tell you that, uh, Mr. Price, that process electronically there is is fabulous in my book. It's fabulous yeah. if they use it. Right. Use it. Right. But you, as the as the licensee, right. need to be able to verify those dates that are punched in if they are inaccurate. So that's that's all I have to say about that. Yep. There's a there's a way you can make it so that you have to actually scan the ID vice manually overriding and punching in something that would be I don't know what that takes but I just throw that out as a suggestion for you um, I mean other, other than that it's it's a it's a pretty nice system it sounds like so right that's what I was going to ask uh, with a lot of licenses now coming with scanning capability does does your system have a have an e-scan capability scan. Okay. we don't have scan capability in in the RASP class Tammy was talking about scanners and she said there is one that's probably 98%, but she said there's a lot of them, so you gotta be careful which one you get. Plus, there's some other things that I picked up in the training that mm -hmm. I think will help too. Mm -hmm. You know, like the mystery shopper and... Right, that's good. Mm -hmm. I had no further discussion, Mr. Chairman. Okay, mm -hmm. discussion's over with. Okay, we have a first, we have a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. Chairman, you? Yes. Opposed? Yes. Do we need to read the caller? Okay. Tatina Nicole Robinson. The above individual, Tatina Nicole Robinson, was an employee of the license holder and sold or provided alcohol beverages to the individual under the age of 21 years of age in violation of 28-2802B of the Alcoholic Beverage Article of the Anacoda Code of Maryland. Please come forward, be sworn in. Absent. No show. We show. So under the statute under 6204 of the Alcoholic Beverage Article of the Code, um, we have the right to petition the circuit court um, um, to enforce our summons or to have her summoned before our, for them to order for her to appear. So if that's what this board would like us to do, we will do that. Okay. There's no, there's nothing that we can do penalty wise at this point until no, she still needs to I mean, the defendant has the right to appear and speak on her behalf. Yep. She's got to be present. Okay. 
Mr. So Chairman, we, I'd like to make a motion that we petition the circuit court to have the uh, defendant appear before us. Okay. And I'll second that. Any discussion? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Every, it's unanimous. I didn't hear what the... We're yeah. going to petition, the, the circuit court can petition her to come before us. Okay. I thought that's what it was, but I just... So, Mr. Chairman, this and this is the first time I've ever experienced this while I've been on the board. Um, this petition then then puts this in the circuit court's hands. Is that correct? We're asking the <clears throat> sorry. We're asking the assistance of the circuit court, pursuant to statute, to order her appearance. Right. So the statute provides us with the authority with this board for the authority to provide summonses and to summon witnesses before the board um, we, we don't have this board doesn't have the enforcement power of so ordered orders that the court has so the statute provides the remedy of going to the court to use the court's authority to comp compel someone to appear so, so then this goes into the 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 circuit court's uh, jurisdiction then, and or we're, does we're it always come back we're to always the board? we're always under the jurisdiction of the circuit court here. Um, it's just again seeking their their assistance, the circuit court's assistance in enforcing the authority of our of this board. Mm -hmm. And there's two I, penalties, right? There's the, there's us, and then there is I'm the there. possibility of of. Circuit court. The courts, correct. Criminal side. So what? Again, this is I'm 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 not experienced in this, and I'm sort of okay. walking out on a limb a little bit. But my understanding is that once we seek the we seek the um, assistance of the circuit court, that's correct. It would it would create two potential issues for for this individual, and that is one failure to appear, right? So right now she hasn't appeared, so she's just in violation of the summons of this board. Um, if she then, if the circuit court issues an order and she fails to appear, now she's in violation of the circuit court's order and it creates a whole new really? set of, of issues. So I'm presuming, and I'm presuming that's why the statute's structured in the way that it is. So the circuit court would force her to appear before this board? That's my understanding. Okay. Um, the, the, again, the, the article is relatively vague when it comes to that. It just ba basically, 6204 basically says that the official issuing a summons may petition the circuit court if a witness summonsed neglects or refuses to attend a hearing or inquiry for which the witness was summonsed or refused to testify. So it doesn't say what they should be, what you're petitioning the court for, but that's my that's my understanding. New territory. It is new territory. Unfortunately, I mean, fortunately, we haven't had to right. cross this bridge before. Right. Okay. Okay. Thank if, you. if it turns out that it's something different, I will advise the board accordingly. Okay. Okay. Anything else that has to be said in this? No, I believe that's it, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Okay, we'll move on to applications. McKay's Market and Cafe, application of Sherry E.M. Price to transfer McKay's Market and Cafe Class B restaurant beer, wine, liquor license from, um, from Sherry E.M. Price, administrator of the estate of Marilyn A. McKay and trade as McKay's Market and Cafe, Hollywood, Maryland, I mean Hollywood Market and Cafe, LLC, 23860 Hollywood Road, Hollywood, Maryland 20636. You hereby declare and affirm under the penalties of perjury that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth and nothing but the truth. I do. Okay, please state your name and address for record. Cherry Price, 20570 Chingville Road, Leonard Town, Maryland. Okay. Please sit down. Good afternoon. And, and, our, and our condolences. Or they're both in? Uh, no, this, he, this is the attorney, so he doesn't okay. have to be sworn. Unless he would like to be sworn. Like, <laughs> like, be... Not giving any testimony. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> uh, <clears throat> please present your application.
You can introduce okay. yourself. You can introduce yourself. Okay. If you, if good, good afternoon. My name is Mike Davis. I'm an attorney. I'm representing Ms. Price here today for her application. Um, Ms. Price is the daughter of Marilyn A. McKay and also the personal representative <coughs> of the state. Ms. McKay da uh, died in 2020. <coughs> and she has been, uh, in effect, acting as the licensee pursuant to the statute since her mother's death, but there comes a time when a license has to be transferred. And she uh, determined to transfer the license to a newly formed LLC. Uh, the name of the LLC is uh, Hollywood <coughs> Market and Cafe LLC. Um, the sole member of the LLC is Fairland Market Inc., a corporation that is that owns the premises in Hollywood. Uh, and uh, there was a, of course, the LLC was formed. There was a meeting uh, where the uh, uh, Fairland Market was determined to be the sole member, 100% owner of the LLC, and at that meeting, uh, Ms. Ms. Price was designated <clears throat> as the authorized person to hold the license on behalf of the LLC. And okay. uh, she has been a resident and uh, a property owner and a registered voter for the requisite period of time. Board members, any questions? Mm -hmm. Yes, Mr. Price, you, you said, so the Hollywood Market and Cafe LLC was the new LLC that was formed, correct? Okay, but mm -hmm. then you mentioned there was another LLC that owns that LLC or owns the building? Uh, the, the sole member, if I may ask, answer for her, okay. the sole member of the LLC is a corporation. You can okay. have individual members, you can have corporate members. Right. In this case, the, the sole member and 100% owner is a corporation, and that's Fairland Market Inc., which also is the owner of the premises where the business is to be conducted. Okay, so I guess my question, Mr. Beavers, is if she is to be the licensee, mm -hmm. I mean, the application is, as I read it, is to transfer the ownership or the, the applicant, correction, not the ownership, transfer of the application to Hollywood Market and Cafe LLC, mm -hmm. but they don't see where Ms. Sherry is the owner of, of that. She's not the owner. She's the authorized, she's an authorized individual for the LLC. Okay, so she's did well. Okay, Would but she, how is she an author? If it's a single member LLC, then she. But doesn't she also have to be listed as, no. as a, uh, an officer of the LLC somewhere? No. no. She just said the LLC has the right to authorize someone, to be an authorized representative of the LLC. Okay. It, they don't. They no, does not have to be a member of the LLC, which would Roger. be an owner. Okay. So then. I guess let me go back to the application then. Um, so in the application though, the applicant is Sherry Price, but the agenda says we're trying to transfer ownership to the LLC. So it's, I think, do you see where I'm confused? Right, it would be, she would, her name would appear her name would appear as the licensee, right, Tammy? Yes. Her name would appear as the licensee on behalf of the LLC. So maybe that's where you're I'm getting confused. Yeah, yeah okay. but it, her name would appear, right? So okay. if anything happened in the future with regard to this license, uh, Ms. Price would appear. It would say Ms. You know, Ms. Price is the licensee. Mr. So, Beavers, so do, we have, do we have any documentation about Ms. Price being the representative for the uh, for the corporation. That those documents are all presented at the time of application. They are, as far as I understand, they were yes. presented. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. There are minutes that uh, right. we okay. had to submit, and they're part of the application. Mm -hmm. 
Sure. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Davis. So at the end of the day, Mr. Beavers, are you comfortable with the application? <laughs> I am comfortable. Um, okay. I definitely am comfortable with that. I reviewed the application and everything seems appropriate. Okay. Yeah, I didn't I didn't see anything outlandish with it. I saw the application, but like I said, there was just that, that little nuance with, but if you're comfortable from the legal representation that it that it's covered then then I'm, I'm happy and, and I appreciate your question because it's it's not necessarily straightforward um, the authorized individual is a little bit it's a little different than what you'd right. see otherwise so it's, your question is well placed okay thank you good I had no further questions mr. chairman anybody else Okay, do we have a motion? Yes, I'll make a motion that we approve the application of Cherry E.M. Price to transfer McKay's Market and Cafe, Class B, Restaurant, Beer, Wine, and Liquor license from Cherry E.M. Price, Administrator for the Estate of Maryland A. McKay, and to trade as McKay's Market and Cafe. Hollywood Market and Cafe, LLC, 23860 Hollywood Road, Hollywood, Maryland, 20636. Okay. We have a motion from Member Cole. Do we have a second? And I'll second that. We have a second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? None? Unanimous? I guess I need to read this now? Yes, please. Yes. Any licensee applicant for a license or group of not less than 10 persons who are residents or real estate owners in the district in which a licensed place of business is located or proposed to be located may within 30 days from the date of any final decision of the board in approving, suspending, revoking, re restricting, or refusing to approve, suspend, revoke, or restrict any license or licensee appeal such a decision to the circuit court for St. Mary's County. The appellate shall be required to pay in advance a sum of money reasonably estimated to cover the expense of transcribing the hearing of the decision being appealed. Thank you. Good luck. Thank, thank you. you. All right. Thank you, Jerry. Special privilege application, Willows Recreation Center. Patricia, our post requesting catering privilege. Please come forward, be sworn in. Not here. Not here. No show. Okay. Mr. Mr. Chairman, I make a motion that we defer this to the next next meeting. Is that appropriate? I don't think you need a motion for that. Yeah. Do you? Do they want to table it for that? Well, they, I mean. She's not here. Not here. Doesn't just get start out. Um, I don't think we have to do anything, do we? It just we'll just pass it, and then next, if she comes back in, and we'll ask, right? Okay. We don't, don't have to do anything. Okay. No. No. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Next item on the agenda is the board administrator's report. Okay. Tammy. Um. Very quickly, since uh, Mr. Price brought it up and you were talking about scanners, 98% um, of the scanners for scanning licenses don't work. And when I say they don't work, there are a lot of very high, high quality, most of the fraudulent IDs out there are high quality and they pass through those scanners, including a lot of our police scanners, okay? So somebody can walk in with a fraudulent ID, scan it, and it looks great, and they make the sale. Um, the other side, as well, is any scanner, whether it is accurate or not, should only be used as a tool um, 
because we've actually had uh, licensees have somebody come in with a license, they scan it. If they don't look at the picture, they don't know who that person is. So we did have a licensee catch um, a license that had a young Asian female, but the person using it was a young white male. So obviously, scanning is not the answer, okay? And, and we did talk to Mr. Price and the other attendees on, on um, we did give them information on a, a scanner that has been used through MELA, Maryland Alcohol Licensing Association, and tested in the field for about two years and has about a 98% accuracy. Um, it is just the way the scanners read and uh, analog, digital, whatever. I, I don't know the, the tech behind it, but it has been used with great help and was actually um, volunteered out to a lot of businesses during COVID so um, in other counties and it was available to us as well. I don't know if anybody actually went in on it. I know a few of our licensees did uh, contact the gentleman who is from originally from Harford County. But, um, so I just wanted to explain that, that scanning is a tool, not the end all, mm -hmm. okay? Um, I've given you a few, um, and I'm sorry, I'm, I'm been a little bit remiss, although one of the bills was just dropped on the 7th. So uh, I have a couple of bills that I went through all of them and there were a lot, but I went through as many that affected us here in St. Mary's County. Okay, I did send you some information. The county commissioners met on Tuesday, uh, being requesting, requesting their support for House Bill 506. Okay, I'm gonna talk about that after, but I'm gonna quickly have you go to House Bill 474 because the other two bills are a little bit related, at least in subject, and this one's different. This one I had um, spoken to Ms. Uh, Lachelle McKay, the um, county administrator, well, the town commissioner's administrator. Um, this bill is only for the corporate town of Leonard Town. The corporate, there is a restriction, a prohibition for you to issue a license to any business that is within 300 feet of a church or a school. That prohibition is exempt, corporate town of Leonard Town is exempt from that prohibition. And it's been operating that way. And the law states that, but in looking, tripping over the law a few months back, we noticed that it was not for class Ds, okay? The corporate town of Leonard Town never issued class Ds, they were never approved, because realize anything in the corporate town of Leonard Town has to be approved by their commission before it comes to you, okay? So, as commissioners changed, they decided, no, we do want some Ds. We're okay with that. We don't have a prohibition on that, but we didn't have the law catch up with the town commissioner's wish, or so we thought it had been, but it wasn't. Um, so this is to correct that. They do want to allow businesses in there, and they want them included in that um, prohibition exemption, okay? So that's what 474 is about. I don't know if you have any questions to that. I'll answer them to the best of my ability, but this is being put in by the town commissioners, not us, although I did talk to Lachelle about it, okay? Um, the other two bills, House Bill 506, I sent you information um, that I had received from uh, the Alcohol Tobacco Commission, Jeff Kelly, who basically said this is not changing the law automatically to making um, it legal for grocery stores or retails, um, chain stores to have a beer and wine class A license. Yes, sir. Do you have a question? Yeah, Tammy, should we discuss how we feel about these different bills well, as, as you present them? That's, that would be, I, I would say that would be yes, but that would be up to your chair how you want to that's up to uh mr willenberg well i mean it's up to you but i mean you'll have that that's what this is about for you to discuss that and we're just going to give you some information all right uh mr willenberg well let's let her give us the information first well i would i would suggest that that we handle these individually as sure. to whether we approve them or not but you're not approving anything you're not being asked to approve anything oh i see yeah I'm just letting you this know just, what's on the table, what's out in legislation right now that affects St. Mary's County. This is just 
for our information? Just Correct. general information. Correct. Okay, now, the board of direct uh, board of county commissioners did not ask for our opinion. They asked for. They are looking for the board's opinion on House Bill 506. 506. Right, which is okay. what I'm talking about right now. All right. All okay. Right. My. So, I'm sorry. Okay. Um, Got gotcha. you. There was some confusion about House Bill 506, and Jeff Kelly from the Alcohol Tobacco Commission did let all the Mela members understand that this is a referendum. It is to put the question on the ballot in November. So that is what the bill is there to do. The bill is to determine whether or not they're gonna put the question on the ballot for the people of Maryland to decide whether or not they want beer and wine for sale in their grocery stores or chain stores, okay? Um, Mr. Adam Borden, um, who is the president of Marylanders for Better Beer and Wine Laws, had also, he is one of the requesters for the county commissioner's support of that referendum bill, okay? Um, he, along with, I believe it was uh, the Marylanders, Maryland Retail Association or something like that. Um, so I did forward you Mr. Borden's um, stand on this and his explanation of why they want this bill. Um, he asked me to, this was what he forwarded to the county commissioners because I don't believe he was there for their meeting on Tuesday. Um, but the Beverage Association was, so they will also give you their information if, um, at their time. Um, so he was just reiterating it as a referendum and why they wanted it. And I did forward that to you for you to have that information. Um, that that in and of itself, the, the county commissioners tabled their decision on whether or not to write a letter of support for this bill because they wanted to see if the liquor board had any input. I'll put it that way, okay? Um, and I'm not gonna ask you to jump into another conversation, but the reason uh, House Bill 858 is an actual bill to grant a liquor license to chains and grocery stores. It's pretty much the same bill that was presented last year and I believe the year before. Okay, so different approaches to the same thing. Exactly. Right, so, eight, so if I may, Tammy, so yes, House Bill 858 um, proposes to amend um, section 4205 of the alcoholic beverage article and you may recall that it's that section that mm -hmm. provides the prohibition to um, the issuance of licenses to you know, supermarkets, chain stores, and discount houses. So there, this bill actually seeks to amend that particular statute that provides the prohibition to that sale, to that license issuance. That's the difference. It is two different approaches, right. when, two different bills trying to achieve the same goal. When is House Bill 858? I'm sorry? When is House Bill 858 to be? It's in your package. I didn't see the. I just put it on the table there. It should be in one. No, no, I, I have a copy of it. When is it supposed? It, it was introduced first time February seventh. Mm -hmm. I, I guess, but it hurts my head. <laughs> it, it, if, it, if it was just, it says introduced in red first time February seventh. It's it still has to go to committee at this point. So I would imagine it's it, probably. It's just, it's just kind of interesting that. I mean, there's a bill to put this decision in front of the people of Maryland, which I'm all for. But at the same time that there's a bill to basically make the change within the House of De uh, Delegates. So uh, hypothetically, you have passed both bills, the House of Delegates approves it, and then the people of Maryland disapprove it, then what, right? I mean, it just, why would you put yourself into a corner like that? This Well, it doesn't. And, and, and so, and the referendum is only, the referendum is allowing it to go on a ballot. In the end, they're going to draft the laws. So this isn't, that's step one. And once, once the voters say, if they say, yes, we, 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 we think this is a good thing, then you're basically giving the people in Annapolis then, our legislators, the, the right to write the laws. Sure. And so you don't, it's kind of like prove it and then we'll tell you what's in it. Um, yeah, provided A comes before B, I absolutely agree with you. I absolutely agree with you 100%, mm -hmm. but that's not the impression I get with the time frame of where this gets, of when 858 gets presented to the House of Delegates for vote. 
or, or is that in fact what the plan is, is is 506 is let's get it on the ballot for, for Marylanders to decide and then we're gonna have House Bill 5, 858 ready to go should they all say yes. If that is the well, plan, then no issue, but. It, well, I don't know if that's the case. I mean, I would imagine, so if 506, which is the amendment proposal to the Constitution, that if that gets approved, that's just approving the question going on the ballot in Correct. November, right? So right. it wouldn't go before the citizens of Maryland until November, right? right? That's why I was concerned is if 858 happens sometime before November, then it sure. seems like you're putting the cart before the horse. Well, actually one would allow the, allow the law to pass sooner than the other. Right. right. So if eight, I mean, if eight five eight ends up getting, if it makes it through the process um, and ends up becoming law, then five oh six is it a moot point for the most part. I mean, you'd still have the question would still go on the on the November ballot for the citizens to, to right. say <laughs> yes or no to, but ultimately the. As you pointed out, the, yeah. the damage. Which is why I find the funny thing, right? It's like, oh yeah, we just passed this bill, right? And then the citizens, you put it for the citizens to vote, and the citizens oh, go, well, yeah, we don't want that, hypothetically. And it's like, well, you knuckleheads already passed the bill. Right. So, well, <laughs> so, I mean, as you know, these these bills don't happen in a vacuum. So the, the right. delegates and the senators are aware that both of these bills exist, right? So that still doesn't make, I mean, they they will, make the right decision. I'm sure they will. <laughs> Determine what they'd like, how they'd like to handle that. None of these are cross-filed. The um, Senate. And I don't believe it's um, cross-filed, is it? The House Bill uh, 506 is. Oh, 506 okay. is cross-filed. Uh, 858 is not cross-filed. No. Okay. I don't believe so. Um, Mr. Beavers, my question would be that you know we're we're directed by the county commissioners <clears throat> to give give our opinion on this. Okay. That's what they're asking us. Sure. My question is, does this warrant a public hearing by the county commissioners as to um, is, is this including on a, as a referendum uh, appropriate um, for a public hearing by the county commissioners before we before we give any kind of opinion because i don't see any any opposition at all to whether the industry approves or or doesn't approve the fact that oh yeah we'll just open it up and all the grocery stores sure. will now have the opportunity to sell beer and wine not liquor, but beer and wine. And the impact to that is effectively, uh, I think, in my opinion, a real burden on any of these smaller mom and pop liquor stores that sell beer, wine, and liquor. Effectively, I think it could lead to the liquor stores just being wiped out as far as beer and wine by the big boxes being able to buy in bulk by the trailer load, beer, wine, you know, and, and stock in their warehouses then for sale, you know, beer and wine where the, where the smaller guys don't have a chance. I'm, I'm wondering is, is it appropriate for there to be a public hearing as to opposition to this referendum. I believe the decision whether a public hearing would be necessary to discuss this would be for the county commissioners to determine. I mean, if they feel it's necessary to have a public hearing to determine whether they would like to support or oppose or be neutral on a bill, that's for them. I believe my understanding from, from speaking with Tammy is that they're just looking for a little extra guidance from this board. Um, given the experience of this board um, with this industry. Um, of course, your your view, as far as I'm concerned, would be based upon your the input from the industry to you. So if you don't have any input from the industry at this point, which you maybe don't, um, it would be maybe difficult for you to give an opinion. Um, it's not on the agenda. And so any sort of decision that we're gonna make a letter of recommendation would be business for next month correct because it's well, not on the agenda it's 
it's under board administrator information. We don't normally put bills mm -hmm. specifically on the agenda and the county administrators are not, I mean, the county commissioners are not asking for a letter of support. Neither is the Maryland, from the board, neither are the Maryland, Marylanders for better beer and wine asking for a letter of support from the board. Um, so they're asking just if the board has input into this before, because they are being asked for a letter of support. Right. And if I might defer to the county attorney's assistant, if that's okay. Are you mine, Chris? No, not at all. Please, John. Members, my name is John Hauser. I'm one of the assistant county attorneys, and I drew the short straw this year in uh, tracking <laughs> legislation of interest <laughs> to the county commissioners, and I was Look the you, one John. who fielded this request on how this began, how this got on the county commissioner's radar as we received out of the blue an email from Mr. Borden, who is president of Marylanders for Better Beer and Wine Laws, asking for the county commissioners to lend their support to a measure that his organization and another trade organization on the retail side of things are pursuing. That's the legislation that you all have been discussing for a few minutes. Uh, this came up in front of my, uh, um, I was actually waiting a negative COVID test at the time. I was not the one who updated the commissioners on Tuesday. It was the deputy county attorney, Neil. But in discussing with the county commissioners, they did ask that before the county commissioners would offer a letter of support or opposition to this bill, that they'd like to see if the Alcohol Beverage Board would have an opinion. Just trusting that this board's particular expertise and knowledge of the industry and this community in the county, if you all were swayed one way or the other, and if there's any information or opinions that you would like to make known or bring light to the county commissioners. The idea was to see what you all had to say to include that in the update to the county commissioners on, te on Tuesday and they will make whatever decision they feel is appropriate to make at that time based mm -hmm. on whatever insight you all would so graciously lend us today and the other information we'll be bringing in front of them at that time. And if you all have any particular questions about that, or if there's anything more I can do to elucidate this request, I'd be happy to do so. Mm -hmm. So my only question is, so are they looking for our opinions on 858 or 506 or both? 858 was not on our radar, and I did, was not aware of it until I just heard about Miss Hildebrand a couple minutes ago. I mean, it was, it was only filed on the seventh, so. Right, yeah. right, yeah. <laughs> I also see that there is no cross file for 858. There's a hearing date on the 21st of this month. I think for right now, the only thing that is in front of our board right now are the two other bills. Uh, if 858 picks up steam where this other one fails and we take an interest, there's a time where we could catch a moment to weigh on, on HB 858 when it's cross filed. Okay. Uh, right now, we are not tracking and mm -hmm. do not anticipate offering a letter of support or opposition for 858, although that might change the political situation develops. But for right now, that's not our request. Okay. I, I know I, I personally have very differing opinions between the two, right? So um, if, if somebody's asking my my personal opinion, uh, again, I do have, I, I have a very different opinion about 858. Um, but if we're not asked to provide an opinion on that, um, I do have an opinion on 506. Um, but I don't know, Mr. Chairman, do we want to consult amongst ourselves as a board and make a unified board recommendation or comment? Or uh, do you think the commissioners are more interested in the individual uh, members of the boards and their thoughts on 506? I think my opinion is that um, both these are to do the same thing. And so maybe what we shouldn't advise them on is necessarily the bill itself, but maybe that we felt that there would be a certain sort of impact. I like to be able to hear the other stakeholders that are in the room before maybe we even start that discussion. Um, because we have subject matter experts in, in here. Mm -hmm. So what I recommend is to deviate from this. I mean, let's let's maybe the, um, Tammy finish up and then we we go ahead and then um, the board, the um, inspector report would be pretty quick and then we can go in and sit there and have a discussion with the community. Alcohol Coalition can sit there and speak on it 
and then Mr. Dent said here, we'll let Mr. Dent speak on it, and then we can. Can can I ask once again? Dave brought Mr. Dent up during these conversations. He can come up now. Well, I wanted to stick to the agenda to some extent. We've asked him before during the same time if he wanted to. So. So. So anyway. Okay, are, are, you, are you finished? Can you stay here? For I can minutes? stay here, absolutely. Okay, Tammy, you uh, want to finish up? Sure. Um, I think Mr. Cole had a question of you. Yeah, Mr. Mr. Chairman, can, can you tell us again who was petitioning the county commissioners to give their opinion on this referendum? This was begun. What initiated this process was a request that we received from Adam Borden, who is from the Marylanders for Better Beer and Wine Laws, who are taking a position that is pro issuing the referendum. Um, their right. ultimate goal is to. Now, who are, who are these people? They are, as far as I can tell, there are two organizations that um, kind of reached out to us. One, Maryland Alcohol Choice, seemed to be a appendage of the Maryland Retail Association, a trade group. Marylanders for better beer and wine laws seem to be its own independent consumer advocacy group. I don't know how closely, if at all, they are aligned with the industry itself or if they are strictly or solely advocating for consumers rather than the industry as a whole. My, my feeling is that they're not, they're not representing consumers as much as they're representing uh, you know, industry, um, you know, manufacturers. That's my personal opinion. And I think one of the um, categories of information that the commissioners would hope to gleam from your all's meeting consideration of this legislation would be this board's opinion on how the passage of the referendum or the ultimate ratification of alcohol sales in retail grocery stores would affect our local mm -hmm. businesses and also the community's public health. And mm -hmm. that obviously has effects on consumers and the industry alike. Mm -hmm. Yes. I think the chairman wants to go ahead and just finish the agenda and then we can circle back and ask yeah. those yeah. questions. Yeah. Okay. Okay, um, going back to board administrator stuff, what we've been doing in the office, it is renewal time, so please, everybody who's listening, get your renewals into us, get them notarized, get them signed, and send them in. Um, we are back doing RAS classes, we are catching up, so we're doing a RAS training every two weeks, um, actually um, specialized by license type, so we can get them in and out of there quickly. And as Mr. Price earlier stated, it was very cold because we had all the windows open and everybody was told to wear their winter gear uh, and their masks because uh, we were gonna blow out as much of our own wind as possible out of the building, okay? So, <laughs> so we were cold, but we were productive. Um, and it went pretty well, I think, it, you know, folks appreciated, Ch chilly, but good. Um, and we'll continue to move on with that. So if you are out there and you haven't been called to um, catch up on your RAS training, we will be calling you soon. Um, and other than going crazy, trying to uh, get it together with renewal, which is working pretty good, there's a drop box in our foyer and our foyer is open right now. So anybody can drop off a completed renewal. Susie's back in the game, so she's processing those. Um, Alcohol awareness training is up and running. Just call us and we will give you a contact number uh, to reach out to the state alcohol awareness training if you need it, because I know some of that was cut down because of COVID, but everything's running back. I don't want to use the word normal and jinx myself, but we're back. Okay. Mm -hmm. And that's it. I have a question. Yes, sir. Um, financial disclosure statements for the board. Uh, most of you, I have received your um, your um, confirmation emails, so I think we're good. Okay, good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Alcohol enforcement coordinator report. Well, inspector. Good afternoon. Uh, since the last board meeting. Um, I've done six inspections. I was out for a while with COVID, so with the weather, that put us behind a couple of weeks. Uh, Tammy and I also did a 
we went with met with another business uh, establishment and talked over some things that we'd heard that was happening and seen that was happening. So uh, did the rash class with Tammy, the mailer classes, and caught up with all my following from the end of last year. So that's pretty much what the last month has been for me. Okay. Do I have any questions? Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Kevin. Thanks, Kevin. St. Mary's Licensed Beverage Association. Mr. Chairman, if it's okay, I'd like another member of the association to come up with me. Please. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is David Dent. I'm with the St. Mary's County Licensed Beverage Association. We're a retail association uh, that looks after the interest of the retail licensees in the county. Um, this is one of our members, Ron Sharma. He uh, may be here sometimes if I can't make it to a meeting. We're, we're gonna try to start attending the meetings. Um, we thank you for offering us uh, time on the agenda uh, to come up and talk and let you know about anything that you know concerns us and alcohol in the county. So mm -hmm. we really appreciate that. Um, if you'd like, Mr. Chairman, we could go right into discussing uh, the bills that you were discussing earlier? Please do. Okay. Um, first, just for the new members on the board, I'd like just to give you a little history uh, about some of the legislation about uh, grocery stores and chain stores. Um, this legislation has been appearing in Annapolis uh, just about every single year for as long as I've been involved with the trade or with our retail association for about 10 years or so. It seems like every year mm -hmm. um, there's a there's a prohibition in Maryland, in case you didn't know, against chain stores and grocery stores having uh, liquor licenses. Um, the reason for that prohibition, um, in my opinion, when it was first, it, this was done back in the 60s, I think. It was put in through the legislation, through the legislators. And it's uh, to try to preserve um, Maryland's three-tier system and to also make sure that local boards such as yours keeps local jurisdiction over alcohol matters in our county. Um, we do oppose having chain stores or um, grocery stores have liquor license. Um, in our opinion, in my opinion, um, we want to make sure that the businesses uh, are local, that the people that run them are local, that we have local ties in our community, and um, we're able, you as a board are able to come and talk to us if there's a problem, as opposed to there being a corporation that might be in state or out of state, but may not have local ties to the community. Um, you know, we think local ties to the community are very important, especially in our industry. Um, alcohol is not like a commodity like bread or milk or you know, a can of grocery, you know, a can of beans or something. It's a controlled substance, and all of our members take the privilege of having a liquor license very seriously. Mm -hmm. And we agree that we should be regulated by a board such as yours, and um, that's our opinion on it. So circling back to House Bill 506, what House Bill 506, and the way I understand it, is a bill that would change the Constitution of Maryland to allow chain stores and grocery stores to hold liquor licenses in the state. It's a statewide bill, not a local bill, it's a statewide bill. And it would be, a, it's, the question would be, um, is just put out there, you know, do you wanna have uh, beer and wine sales in grocery stores? And if it, the referendum came back yes, then that would be a change to the Constitution of the state of Maryland that would then allow legislators, I guess, to, to make a law. Um, mm -hmm. Our opinion on that is that the, legislation, the uh, legislators are the ones who created the prohibition, and we feel that if that needs to be changed, legislators should change it, not have a referendum before the state mm -hmm. and have um, you know, have it decided that way. The couple reasons for that, um, it's, if anybody's familiar with a poll, you know, if you can write a poll question and get any answer that you want the way you write the question. 
So the way that the, the question in the bill is written is, would you like to have um, beer and wine available in your grocery store? If I read that, I'd say yes. But you know, the, the real question is, do you want to have a, an additional thousand more licenses for alcohol in the state of Maryland? Do you want to cripple the existing retail stores in the, in the, that are currently operating in Maryland under the rules that were set up? Um, are there health concerns? Do the health officials in the state have concerns about whether that would be a good idea or not? So our position is we do not, we are not for a referendum. Um, we are for legislators making that choice of mm -hmm. whether or not, you know, they'll, they'll be able to listen to the health officials. They'll be able to listen to all of the, uh, the people that have skin in the game. Mm -hmm. um, is there any questions about that or did I explain that correctly? Thank you, you did a very good job. Mm -hmm. Very well, well done. Mm -hmm. Very good. Okay. David, I do have a question. Uh, the other gentleman, yes, what, what business do you own? Uh, Wildwood Wine and Spirits and Wildwood Shopping Wildwood Center. Wildwood Wine yes. and Spirits, the one that's right there. Uh, Be between, or right next Bath to. and Beyond. Yes, and, and JC right Benny, right that? between. Them. Okay. Yes. What was your name again, sir? What was your name again? Ron Sharma. Okay. Awesome. Mr. Sharma has been a long-standing member of the association and you know, it's just the way things are now, sometimes I'm not always available for meetings and we're trying to involve yeah. other people from our membership to, um, you since you're so gracious to allow us to speak, we want to make sure we have a representative here mm -hmm. when, whenever possible. Mm -hmm. Good. That'll be how, good to have someone else as well. How big is your uh, membership? Are, are most of the retailers part of your membership? Um, right now, our membership in St. Mary's County for the Licensed Beverage Association runs uh, around 25 or 30. Uh, it, it goes up and down depending. Um, I think, Tammy, what are the, the number, total number of licenses are probably about 150 maybe? 100, 158 to 165. Right. So, um, you know, we, we've had a, a membership high of up to 50 people, but just, okay. um, you know, the way thing, we've been losing membership uh, over the past couple years with COVID. and. Um, you know, it, it's hard to get a member, it's someone that runs a business, um, especially the mom and pop stores like most of the liquor stores are, it's hard to take time away from your business. Right, I understand. Uh, but yep. we do, mm -hmm. you know, we do try to reach out to everybody, member or not. Okay. Uh, we're also part, just to give you an idea, we're also part of a, a state association, the Maryland, uh, Maryland State Licensed Beverage Association, um, and then we're also affiliated with the American Beverage Licensees, which is a national organization. So um, we represent, you know, we try to represent local issues. Uh, the state, obviously, uh, I'm involved with the state. I'm a former past president of the state association. Um, and then I'm also on the, or I actually just got off as a board of director of the American uh, Beverage Licensees. Uh, we just had some change. Um, then one of the new presidents uh, took over that board position. I'm on the, I'm a board member on the uh, Maryland License Association. Okay, thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. Anything? Any other issues, Mr. Dent? Uh, yes, sir. If I could speak for a minute about the uh, 858. Um, as as you guys have just heard, that bill has just been um, uh, introduced two days ago. Um, that bill is just. Uh, a, a retread of prior bills that you know have been put in over the past few years. Um, they seem to come back. Uh, are the proponents of, of putting uh, alcohol in grocery stores and chain stores? Mm -hmm. um, you know, tend to bring this up just about every year. Uh, they bring it back with a few nuances. Last year, um, for example, they were trying to uh, get licenses approved if uh, the community was considered a food desert, which is th there's no food or you know, not enough quality food available for the community. But the way that in my, in the way I understand it, in my opinion, the way they carved out those food deserts would probably include like 85 or 95% of the state of Maryland. So, you know, again, it was just a, a way to try to get um, alcohol <coughs> in chain stores and, and um, grocery stores and such. 
Um, this bill, you know, it, it's basically the same thing. It takes a little bit different tack. You know, the, I haven't had a chance to review it completely, obviously, because I just found out about it myself last night um, when I contacted the state, our state association about it. You know, they confirmed that yes, this is, you know, it's a, it's another um, another grocery store chain store bill, and they're reviewing it. Um, so, uh, if you have any questions about that. If I can't answer them, I can get you the answers. Okay. Um, so, David, who is, uh, um, what what's uh, part of Maryland does delegate voice represent? Do you know? I'm really not sure, sir. I'm sorry. Okay, can you find that out? I for can. Us? Yes, okay, sir. Okay, thank you. So, I was just reading about a product recently. I guess PepsiCo and other soda companies are going into the manufacturing of alcoholic products. Yes. Um, and though they said that they were being made in a way that it'd be easily be able to distinguish it from the actual products, I remember seeing one that looked like a Mountain Dew product. Yes. And you look at it and it's like, wow, that's Mountain Dew, but it's really some sort of malt liquor or something like that, right? <laughs> right, right. So. Is that going to be a problem? I mean, like if you had grocery store chains and then you have soda manufacturers that are now making alcoholic beverages and marking them under their under their under their brand names. Mm -hmm. If I may, ask. yes, I think it would be a big problem. Uh, Coca Cola, which owns Topo Chico, they just came out with uh, alcoholic seltzer and Bang Energy Drink, which is very popular with young kids and a lot of other people are also coming out with uh, alcoholic cells. And they look very similar to the non-alcoholic drink. So it depends how the grocery stores market it. They can market it the way they want to, where, where they position in the store to sell it most. I think it, it's targeting a lot of young, young generation, all those things are. And they're also providing their own transportation. So they're distributing these products themselves. So it's taking the, the, the distributor, like we have here, out of, the, out of the picture. At least they're going to do it as many places as possible. So if you have grocery stores, chains, and Pepsi's delivering their alcoholic products to the chain store, Mm -hmm. and, they would and, they would still have to comply with the with the with the three tier system, whether it's Pepsi, Coke, or, not, or I, Budweiser. I I get that right now, but this it's a it's again it's a discussion about. Mr. Dent was saying that it's all part of and it helps to pull apart mm -hmm. the three tier system. So and and it was a really interesting article I read, but they Pepsi is going to use their own distribution network. I'm not saying they're going to use it in Maryland because Maryland doesn't allow it. Mm -hmm. But a lot of states do allow it. A lot it. of states, they would, let, they would do it, yeah. Mm -hmm. A lot of states do allow but it. But a lot of, lot of alcohol manufacturers have their own distributor companies. I mean, or they own them. So it's not much of a difference, is it? I think it's more of, I think your concern is more of a marketing concern, correct? They're going to be all in the same truck. And yeah, and it's, 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 it's hard to see the difference. They said they're going to try to sit there and make it so it was clearly a you know alcoholic stuff. But if you look at right. if you read the article, if you look at the pictures, if you look at the trucks that are distributed, and and, and it's like mm -hmm. it's not some other company. It's not like a corporation that owns three or four or five different brands. They're branding this pretty much as their product. And I'm saying, and then you have that product at a grocery in a, in a, in a chain grocery store, and yeah. it just blurs things, especially if the product looks similar to Mountain Dew. And then you're rigging it up. Mr. Chairman, do you mind if I ask a couple of questions? I don't know if I'm sure, not a please. board member. Um, just I was listening to Mr. Dent speaking and talking about his experience in the, the associations and. Um, I just had a question. Do you know how many states currently allow beer to be sold um, in grocery stores? Um, I don't know the exact number. I can get that for you. I know there are a number of places. I know there's, uh, um, I believe Washington State is one of the most current examples of a of state that changed the laws. Mm -hmm. And, you know, ag again, 
I think they're having a little buyer's remorse in that state because of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but I can I can get you details. If I if I said to you, 47 states currently so allow the sale of beer in grocery stores, would would that be surprising to you? Um, it wouldn't be surprising, but I, I really don't know what the number is. So, okay. so I would be speculating. So let's say it's 47. Why is Maryland different, or, or why is it a problem? Why would it be a problem in Maryland to sell beer in a grocery store where it doesn't seem to be a problem, or um, in 47 other states? Well, what's I, the I, difference? I, th I think the answer as a retailer would be the way the laws have been set up. Um, they have encouraged. Uh, a lot of families and, and mom and pops to invest their life savings into businesses right. and long-term leases. And if we were to change the rules in the middle of that, there'd be a lot of people mm -hmm. that have made 10 or 15, 20 year plans that their business would be worthless, that still have leases to pay um, and they wouldn't be able to support themselves. So um, I think it's the way Maryland has structured their laws as part of the reason for that. Um, you know, I, I think Maryland has a good um, system of making sure that there's local control uh, by the community over what goes on in their community right. as it, mm -hmm. it reports alcohol. So I think it's a very strong system that Maryland has, and I think it's a very good system. And I would add that most of the states that you talked, they never had a local control. Mm -hmm. The liquor licenses were always controlled by the state, mm -hmm. where in Maryland it always has been that local jurisdiction had a lot of control. So those for those people, those laws that have changed over years were all done at the state level without. Right. I, I'm, I'm just curious because, again, we're, we're looking at legislation to allow this or not to allow it. And if it's being exercised already in other states, we always look for litmus tests, correct? We look for examples or, or, or areas where we can make an educated decision on whether we should or shouldn't do it and what's in the best interest of the consumer and the, and the citizens of our state, right? So that's why I was asking that whether, and, and, and that my follow-up question was going to be, um, you know, have you guys looked at other states and, and what the ramifications have been? You are saying Washington State, for example, that recently maybe has changed that, mm -hmm. what the ramifications of that change has been to, to smaller, the smaller uh, community businesses. Has there been a negative impact there um, or has it been a positive impact? I don't, I don't know. And I think that's something that could be helpful mm -hmm. for this board, the county commissioners and people of Maryland to know um, whether this would be a, a positive change or a negative change. Mm -hmm. I think one example would be Florida. A few years back, they changed. They had pretty similar law, not as, but like us, where Pom and Pop used to own. Mm -hmm. And they changed the law. And I believe as much as 90% of Mom and Pop stores have shut down mm -hmm. in the state of Florida. Mm -hmm. Because it's not just grocery store. It will be ever, every Wawa, 7-Eleven, Dollar General, Dollar Stores. Everybody will be able to right. sell beer. Right. wine, if not liquor, but at least those. And for most of the stores, like me, it would be almost 70, 75% of our business that would be gone. Gotcha. So, so Ron, with, with data like that, right, are you are you guys aggregating that data and putting together some sort of a package that, that, that is a, it's almost a recommendation, right? Mm -hmm. Aggregate that data, put it together mm -hmm. into a package that you can present to the county commissioners, mm -hmm. right, from your position to say, Again, you know, kind of dovetailing onto what Mr. Beavers was saying, right? Look at, you know, look at other states that why are they, you know, the states that allow it, why are they different, right? Well, because they control it at the at the, um, you know, at the state level. They've kind of always been that way, so you know, there's no net, you know, net negative effect, right? Other states that have made a change recently, such as Washington. Okay, well, this is the consequence of what happens because they were like us, made a change and. Right, you know, from from you and your own businesses and the other businesses in here. Hey, this is how much business we typically do in, in this area, and then some of that you have to kind of model you to to maybe try to estimate you know what the potential impacts to to those businesses would be, right? And then again to the ultimate lead to the to the same areas or the state economy. Um, so I think again, if you guys can put together that kind of data. Right to support, um, you know, pretty pictures and pretty pictures and charts go a long way, right? With with graphs and numbers and things of that nature, um, 
and, and present that to uh, to the commissioners. I think that would speak a lot um, to to be able to kind of you know present the argument, present your case. I, I mean, I, I agree with everything you're saying. So. Right. Yes, sir. I understand. Um, and if I could, too, Mr. Chairman, just to circle back real quick, uh, we did attend that county commissioner meeting, um, and um, I think what they were doing is, is just trying to get some input from your board uh, before they made a decision. I believe they were publicly stating that uh, they, were, they were asked to support the, uh, the bill by the other group. And I, I think they were leaning in the direction of not only not offering support, but also but offering uh, dissent to it, saying they, they were opposed to it. But before they did that, I think they just wanted to hear from you guys if you had an opinion, either yes or no, um, one word to that. When we went before them, we weren't asking them for uh, a dissent letter. You know, we were just saying we didn't support them uh, supporting it. Um, so, and I, I'm not putting, I'm trying not to put words in their mouth. That was just what I got from the, the open meeting. Well, that, I guess that last commissioner's meeting, though, that was about 506, right? Because 858 hadn't even come. Correct. That, that was only about 506. Right, right. Yes, so, so, yeah, so, again, even though they are, they are similar but different, um, again, that same argument, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you should mm -hmm. definitely put that in front of them. Yes. They're very different, actually, but they have the same end result. Yes. True, yes. Yeah, how they go about doing things. Anything else? No, sir. We appreciate your time. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you very much. Right. Thanks, thank gentlemen. Thank you, David. Mm -hmm. So we're going to we have to sit that? there and take a real fast pause because we have an, a slight error. Yes. My and, fault. And... Um, so we had a motion to approve the license transfer. I failed to. So you want me to read this in and we're going to vote on this again? Well, what is the procedure? Because we, they passed a motion approving, but I failed to let them know there are conditions that need to be met. And so the, it was an immediate approval versus a conditional approval. So do they have to, and I wanna do this while Mr. Cole's still here, cause I know he has to leave in a few minutes. Mm -hmm. I would say you would have to, you would have to rescind the prior. Rescind the motion? Yeah, and then make a new one with the, uh, okay. with the conditions. Were those conditions not in the, showed up in the application? It's on the application, but you didn't say it. It wasn't and part, so it, it wasn't part of the motion. Part of the motion. Part of the motion. I, and I, I guess I apologize, cause I didn't see, I didn't notice it's it. It's my fault too, cause usually I bring light to this. You'll either ask me, but, if you don't, I normally jump in. Sorry, my apologies. So my recommendation would be to rescind the prior motion approving um, the application. And you would vote on the rescission. And, and the person who made the motion should be the one rescinding. And then we're going to have to... Make a new motion. And then you're going to notify them. Oh, absolutely, yeah. <laughs> What? I figured that I figured the assistant county attorney is here. I could, you know, <laughs> get support from him, but uh, I got a shrug. So the answer is <laughs> okay. So, I mean, technically, by law, you couldn't approve that right away because these are agencies that have not under overrule on you. Right. So, okay. so the original motion was made by. Mr. Cole. Are you talking about for the application. Yes. Yeah. Yes, Mr. Cole made the initial. And then Mr. Mr. Shin, Shin, second. Okay. <clears throat> so we need to rescind. rescind. Yeah. I need a motion from you to rescind your 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 a motion to approve the uh, McKay's Market Cafe and Cafe okay. license transfer. Okay. I'll make a motion that we rescind the um, application of uh, Cherry E M Price. Uh, to transfer McKay's Market and Cafe Class B Restaurant Beer, Wine, and Liquor License from Cherry E.M. Price, Administrator for the Estate of Maryland A. McKay and Trade as McKay's Market and Cafe, Hollywood Market and Cafe, LLC, 
23860 Hollywood Road, Hollywood, Maryland, 20636. Okay, we have a motion. Okay, so motion. I guess I, I need to rescind my original second motion. <laughs> okay, so I, I'll second your mm -hmm. rescind, rescinding of, of the approval of Do the- Do we have any discussion? No. Both. So you got that? Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed, none, passes. Now, Mr. Cole, we need another motion. It could be by anybody, but. What are the conditions? Or anybody. The conditions are personal property tax, trader's license, retail, sales, amusement, and withholding tax. Oh, good heavens. Can and you occupancy permit. Go a little slower, please. <laughs> personal property tax. Trader's license, uh, retail, retail sales, amusement, and withholding tax, and the occupancy permit. So this then becomes conditional, right? The application yes, sir. will become conditional you need on, to put a, on these, okay? Whoever makes the motion needs to put a <clears throat> time frame. 90 okay. days. I make, an I make a motion for the application of Cherry EM price to transfer McKay's Market and Cafe Class B restaurant beer, wine, and liquor license from Cherry E.M. Price, Administrator of the Estate of Maryland A. McKay, and to trade as McKay's Market <coughs> and Cafe, Hollywood Market and Cafe, LLC, 23860 Hollywood Road, Hollywood, Maryland, 20636. This application then being conditional upon the receipt of personal property tax um, reports, trader's license, retail sales, and occupancy permit on a 90-day conditional approval. Okay. Okay? Yes, sir. Thank you. All right. You're welcome. Do we have a second? And I'll second it. Okay. Mr. Shin seconds it. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 It's unanimous. Thank you. And the licensee is going to be notified of this. Yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you. And I'm there sorry. You. Great. Okay. Mr. Chair, Mr. Chairman, at this time, I have to leave the proceedings, so I leave them all in your capable hands. Thank you, sir. Hope you have a good day. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Okay. Next item on the agenda is the Community Alcohol Coalition. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, the Community Alcohol Coalition continues with our monthly meetings and I'm pleased to announce that they are back to live and in-person meetings. Um, so uh, public is more than welcome to attend. We're also considering along with all of our alcohol concerns, uh, the marijuana bills um, that are being presented because that if passed may be a similar type of uh, abuse issues, et cetera, as we're seeing with alcohol. So there is some talk about us bringing on that issue in combination with. Other than that, we're proceeding as normally. Okay. Any questions? Yeah, I got a question. Yes. So the more readily accessible alcohol is, is there data that suggests that the more available, the more abuse, the more uh, um, problems with alcoholism or um, right. mental health issues or 
There may be off the top of my head. I can't think of any, but I could look into that. Okay. I've I've read some papers which which do state that, and I just wanted mm. to have your opinion on it. Yeah. Okay. I, I wouldn't be surprised, but that I, I'd have to look at the research to find that. Okay. Appreciate it. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, now it's our time. Do you have anything else for us before we start this discussion? I think everything I stated before um, just stands. The county commissioners are just looking to get what input and what information they can. And any information that you all would like to bring of light to them, any recommendations or facts you feel that they ought to know or would be helpful for them to know and come into their decision would be much appreciated. I'm just here to answer any questions and facilitate that discussion however I might be able to. Well, we'll pass it down to the end first, I guess. Why don't we do that? Yeah, I think uh, I concur with, uh, I forgot, apologize. Yeah. David, David Dent. Right. Dent. Um, I think the serious consideration needs, needs to be taken for local businesses and their survivability, right? So we need to, I know that we're looking, as a committee, we're looking for um, not only, uh, I, I would think, for enforcement of alcohol beverage controls, but also we're looking for the welfare of the business in, in locality. And also, like, again, I don't have the facts, but um, in turn, the other question, which perhaps we might want to address is not only from business perspective, in terms of states that do uh, allow grocery chains to um, sell alcohol beverages versus not other are there public health issues pros and cons associated with are there more violations because they're being more readily available to buy these larger chains I, I, I don't know that's apart from business aspects that's that's the public health aspects I don't know how you go about gathering that data but that's that, that would be pretty I would I'm not sure if that data exists or not um, but again, from the business side, I, I would have been a business owner myself. Um, I used to own a restaurant, Panera, Panera Bread comes in, different chain, national chain comes in, and first thing that impacts is local businesses. And I think from national perspectives, there's got a bit of balance there. So that would be my, my opinion. Okay. Barbara? I'm, I'm pretty much in agreement with the Richard. I think it would, um would hurt our local businesses I mean you know I really do I mean we've been without it for all this time why we need it now that's how I feel about it I mean I don't want to take my grandchildren to the grocery store and everybody behind me in a grocery cart buying beer and wine I mean what does that say for the kids you know I think it should be separate I don't think it should be in grocery stores I think it would really hurt the mom and pop businesses and it's not just grocery stores. It's but Walmart. Yeah, it's it's Walmart. Stores. I mean, it's it's Everywhere. Walmart. Yeah, yeah. Costco, I mean, really. Walmart. Yeah, yeah. Right. It could be Dollar General. It could. Yeah. Yeah. Don't some of these states that do allow it have like ABC stores? So the state owns the the liquor store part of it. Yeah. yeah. So the only thing that. this commercial is really, I mean, that's the private sector selling is right. the yeah. beer and wine. Yeah. So I go to Virginia a lot. Virginia basically they sell beer, wine, and grocery stores. So basically, all the locals stores becomes the hard liquor store so that that becomes differentiation right yep. <laughs> mr watts um well so there's a couple of things obviously the the overall intent of the two bills uh i definitely agree with uh with uh, everybody else's opinion and and with mr dent's opinion um i think it would have a negative given the way our state has been set up and operates currently uh i think this would have a devastating impact to local businesses um, which obviously i'm a huge proponent of supporting um you know on a separate note i you know very disappointed in our delegations for how they've presented these bills and put these bills um you know i mean from a 
the from 506 perspective, putting it in front of the people for a constitutional amendment. I, I'm never opposed to putting something in front of the people of, uh, of Maryland to be able to vote on. However, as Mr. Dent definitely pointed out, right, how you ask the question can oftentimes lead the answer, which is very discouraging, very frustrating, and I, it's one of the things I hate about politics. Um, I got into politics, but to stop that. So, uh, you know, so, so if I were in, you know, if I were to say I was in favor of Bill 506 to put it in front of people to, for consideration, I wouldn't be opposed to that, but I would say that my opinion, it would have to be rewritten as it currently is because it's very, it, it, it just, there's so many open-ended unanswered questions about it uh, that I think, you know, anybody to make a, an informed decision, I don't think somebody at the ballot box would be able to make an informed decision with the question that's on there the way it is. And I think it would lead people to making a, a, a wrong, I don't want to say a wrong decision. I would think it would make people leading, lead people to make a uninformed dis decision. So, so I have challenges with that from that perspective, but then again, the, with the House Bill 858, which again, a little bit different because it's just new to everybody. Um, you know, basically it just, again, it sounds like it's just the kind of continued pursuit from, uh, you know, the, the, the outside entities that are wanting to, you know, push this. And so it sounds like it's, it seems like it's kind of the, the annual, um, let's try to push this bill through. Uh, and so, um, you know, I, again, I'm, I'm not in favor of making the changes. Uh, I, I hope that Mr. Dent and the Alcohol Coalition uh, can can do what they need to do to to convince the, you know, I, I would send that data also not only to the county commissioners that I was suggesting, but send it to the delegates as well. You know, every everybody who will who'll listen, you know, hey, this is why, here's the data behind why we think this will have a negative impact on uh, on our economy and our on our businesses. Um, if I could clarify one thing, Mr. Watts, just yes, one thing you said in there, um, spoke of the local delegation. I just want to make it absolutely clear that our delegates and state senator are not uh, sponsors or, and that may have been. I, yeah, I may have misspoke. I, I, I apologize. I meant to say Delegate Boyer and Delegate uh, Gee. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, but thank you for, for asking for that clarity. No worries, yeah. I just wanted to make sure that. <laughs> don't, um, don't want to throw those guys under the bus if they weren't behind it, yeah, for sure. <laughs> I, I am also not necessarily a fan of this. And um, so I, I guess we're all pretty much giving you information that you need, right, so? I think so, I can, um, for right now I can, my report as written right now would just be that the um, members of the Alcohol Beverage Board who spoke unanimously spoke that they are against the proposed legislation as written. The only thing I could think to do in addition would be if that this board wanted to make a motion to formally recommend that the county commissioners do not support the legislation. That would be your all's discretion, but it's not I can certainly report the facts and what you all have said in your opinions that you have stated as they are right now. That'd probably be sufficient. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you all very much. Yeah. Thank you for giving this issue your time this afternoon. Yeah. Thank you for coming and helping explain everything. Yeah. The one thing Mr. Dent spoke about framing the question, I remember a few election cycles ago back that they had a question about basically it was gerrymandering. Oh, yeah. And it started out as per the U.S. Constitution, you know, and the, and the, the referendum law, it was like this long. And as soon as people read, oh, Constitution, that's good stuff, it was like dog licking up great, you know, um, antifreeze. <laughs> and and we, we voted to support gerrymandering, you know? And, and I believe when it gets on the referendum, if it does, then there's also the weight of the entire alcohol industry from the outside who would like to see this. And I don't know if the if it's a fair discussion at that point. Right. Big corporate America and, and television ads and radio ads and all that stuff, and then, you know, the mom and pop stores, how are they gonna sit there and fight it off? Anyway, 
appreciate Mr. Dent coming in here and speaking. Thank you. Anybody else have anything else for the board? Time? No? Okay. Do we have a motion to adjourn? I'll make a motion that we adjourn. And I'll second that. Mr. Watts and Barbara Hill, all in favor? Aye. 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 Done. Thank you.